Hi, my name is Pat Salmon. I'm a historian and an author and a retired curator. I'm here today at the Noble Collection uh, to discuss uh, something that's little known for more Staten Island history, a place called the Mariner's Family Asylum. You see, if you go back to the late 1700s, into the 1800s, and even into the 1900s, Staten Island was viewed as a wonderful location for certain institutions and facilities. Um, it, was, it was viewed as being a healthful place. The population was smaller. But there was also a dark side to the situation. Um, many Off Island residents viewed Staten Island as being far off, especially from Manhattan and Brooklyn. And they viewed it as a, a place to, to, let's say, cast uh, the elderly, the homeless, uh, the mentally ill, the developmentally disabled, uh, perhaps people who had drug or alcohol problems. They wanted those people um, as far away from them as possible. And so, as I said, they viewed Staten Island as a faraway place. Um, at Staten Island in the 1700s, late 1700s, the 1800s, it was viewed as a place um, that, you know, that they was very far away. And I mean, real estate was inexpensive. There was a, a workforce around that uh, perhaps didn't require as much of an income as in other places like Manhattan or Brooklyn. Um, and so we see in 1799, we see the quarantine station opening for people with contagious diseases, usually immigrants. Uh, 1831, we see a place called the Seamen's Retreat opening uh, for uh, sailors and seamen who have illnesses and they're thought to be temporary illnesses or in injuries. We see Sailor Snug Harbor opening up in 1833. Um, and then we see the Mariner's Family Asylum opening about 1853 on property owned by the Seamen's Retreat. Uh, perhaps it all culminates culminated uh, back in the 1950s when Willowbrook State School finally opened. Uh, it had been planned in the 40s to open, but of course it was taken over as a, a hospital for injured uh, soldiers and seamen coming back from World War II. But again, in the 1800s, you know, um, Staten Island was a, was a, a, a a location that was viewed as preferable for these institutions. There were ferries going back and forth from Staten Island. Uh, some, many ferries, of course, going to Manhattan, going to Brooklyn, where some of these institutions actually had their headquarters. As I said, there was a, w a ready, willing, and able workforce on the island who would work for little, a little, little money. Um, we had available open spaces. And that was something that many of these institutions wanted too, because oftentimes they established farms on these properties. There was a farm here at uh, Sailor Snook Harbor. There was farms at uh, Mount Loretto, at St. Michael's Home, and other locations. Um, they also felt that by establishing the homes here, if the people who resided in them got residence, uh, perhaps those uh, got, got visitors, excuse me, if they got visitors, they wouldn't come and visit very often. And if they didn't come and visit very often, whatever what was going on, whatever was going on at the institution could be sort of, you know, kept quiet. There weren't too many people to report on bad situations. So, we see all of these institutions opening up on Staten Island. Now back to the Seaman's Retreat that opened in 1831. It opened at the corner of Vanderbilt Avenue and what we now call Bay Street. As a matter of fact, you'll know the property today as um, the, the former Bailey Seaton Hospital. Well, uh, they opened up and they used funds that were collected by sailors and, and ship's captains that came into the New York Harbor going back to the 1700s. They were required to pay a tax for every sailor that came. In. The money went into a fund, and as the fund accumulated, they decided to open the Seaman's Retreat in the Clifton section of 
Staten Island. And as I said, that was where sailors were treated with diseases or injuries that they were expected uh, to recover from. As opposed to a place like Sailor's Snug Harbor, where you had uh, seamen and sailors and captains who were pretty much retired or permanently injured. So they had a permanent home here. Now, we see the Seamen's Retreat opening in October 1831 with 34 patients. Now, from this time until the 1870s, over 57,000 men would be treated at the Seamen's Retreat. Um, some of the illnesses were attributed to, quote, sailors' dissolute habits while on shore, but also because of his toilsome labors while he was on shipboard. They were not treated very well, sailors, back in those days. All right, so we look at the 1887 Beers Atlas of Staten Island, and it clearly shows us the seamen's retreat. Now, we see two small cemeteries on that property. And if you look closely, one of those cemeteries is near a location known as the Mariner's Family Asylum. And that is the proper name of that facility. But on occasion, many people uh, used Two, one of two derogatory terms when they referred to the asylum. They would call it the home for old ladies or the old ladies' homes. Um, it was a facility that aided the wives, the daughters, the mothers, and the sisters of the sailors who, you know, were d disabled uh, by injury or illness, and they could no longer take care of the women in their lives. So the Mariner's Family Asylum was established in order to help these women. Um, eventually would give them a place to live, but we're not quite at, the, at that location yet. Um, you know, during the 19th century, unmarried elderly women were probably the most vulnerable group in society, especially if they didn't have siblings or nieces or nephews to care for them. There was no social security back then. Women generally didn't have any kind of careers. And so uh, very often the, the, the elderly unmarried women ended up in bad straits back in those days. Um, and they ended up very often in places like almshouses or uh, pauper's residences or, or a farm colony here on Staten Island. So um, a group of women who ran an organization known as the Female Beth Bethel Society of New York City, they got together and they, by 1841, and they decided that they really wanted to help these women as best they could. In the beginning, they, they sort of provided work for impoverished women, and usually it had to do with sewing. They sewed garments, they sewed clothing, they made towels and, and things of that nature. Um, eventually, the, the Bethel Society was able to gather enough money up where they could even give a little bit to the really elderly uh, people, who, women who could not take care of themselves. So they sort of gave them a little pension and they could get by and pay the rent and buy, buy some food. I mean, there was never a lot of money. Eventually, the Bethel Society merged with um, the Mariner's Family Industrial Society, and um, they became a powerhouse ch uh, charity moving along through the 1800s. And in order to help these women who were impoverished, they would put on fundraisers every year. They would have annual fairs. Now, most of these women who were, you know, the trustees or the administrators of this organization lived in Brooklyn. So they started having their fairs and their various fundraisers in that location. And um, as I said, they were um, very good at what they did. They were so good, in fact, that in 1845, they actually got the governor of Sailor Snug Harbor to uh, agree to a contract for some of these clothes that the women were making. They, um, you know, the, the governor here said, okay, you know, we, we would like to support you. In the meantime, we'll get garments for the men who live here at Sailor Snug Harbor. 
harbor. So that, unfortunately, did not go on for very long because the, whoever was in charge of purchasing here at Sailor Snug Harbor felt that they were paying a lot more money than they had originally been paying. But fortunately, again, about a year after that, Sailor Snug Harbor once again began buying uh, clothing and garments and linens and things like that from the Mariner's Family Industrial Society. They even got a contract with the United States Navy for the Navy to buy garments from them as well. And a little secret here that I just recently found out, that contract came about because Mrs. Alexander Hamilton went to bat for the Mariner's Family Industrial Society with the Navy. So she really helped out the organization. All right, so it's the late 1840s and the Mariner's Family Industrial Society. They're, you know, they're hiring these women to uh, make the garments, make the clothing. They are providing little pensions for some of the, the women who just cannot do anything anymore. But they decide they would like to build uh, a facility on Staten Island where some of these women could live year round, 24 seven, and they wouldn't have to worry about where their next meal was coming from, where their clothing was coming from. And, and so they, they went full speed ahead in trying to get this, this building built. And they decided that, uh, and they went to the New York, New York State Legislature, and the legislature agreed that some of that money that was accumulating from the sailors coming into the harbor and paying that tax with every, every visit to the harbor, the New York State Legislature decided that a portion of that money should go towards the construction of the Mariner's Family Asylum. And it was further decided that it would be built on six acres of land on the Siemens Retreat facility that I mentioned earlier, you know, was located at what is now Bay Street and, and, and Vanderbilt Avenue. So they actually were able to get six acres. It was located on what was then called Center Street. Uh, today we call it Tompkins Avenue. It's a sort of a little north of the Hungerford School, let's say. If you know where the New York Foundling Hospital is today, that is exactly where the Mariner's Family Asylum once stood. There was just one problem, and that was that the Siemens Retreat was not completely on board with giving up the six acres of land and seeing money going towards a home for these women. And some of the men on the board fought it tooth and nail. Meanwhile, some of the men on the board were on the building committee in order to get the asylum built. And boy, they must have went on for five or six years trying to get this asylum built. It was really quite a time and, and quite a lot of bad feelings and, and contacting the New York State uh, government in Albany. And they, I mean, they just went back and forth and back and forth. Um, finally, in 1851, they were able to, they hoped, start to move on this Mariner's Family Asylum. But they got a bid to build the building, and it was like three, four thousand dollars over budget. So they had to, you know, stop everything once again. Another disappointment, they couldn't get the place built. So they decided they would continue with the fundraising. Uh, they would continue, you know, they were, and they were still fighting with the Siemens retreat, trying to just get the thing built. Well, finally, they got a lot of lawyers involved in 1852, and once the lawyers started speaking with the government, it was finally decided that it was time to get this building built. So during June 1852, the cornerstone for the Mariner's Family Asylum is finally laid. Um, the, the managers of the, Mar of the Mariner's Family Industrial Society were looking forward to bringing the aged pensioners from their comfortless attics and crowded rooms to the airy and clean home that they were building. Uh, there would be people there to, quote, watch over their interests, add to their comforts, and smooth their pathway down to the dark valley and shadow of death. 
In other words, the women would have a home for the rest of their lives in an environment that was clean, uh, people there to care about them, to care for them, and, 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 and help them for the remainder of their lives. Um, and even though the cornerstone was laid, there was still problems over at the Siemens retreat. But, you know, things finally did settle down, and um, they finally were able to move into the, uh, into the Mariner's family home in 1853. They had a nurse and a matron there. Of course, the matron was there round the clock seven days a week. When the facility first opened, 17 women had moved in. And it was, it was said that um, uh, six were originally from Ireland, three were from Scotland, one woman was from Holland, with the remainder of the women being American. Uh, several of the women who were living there actually had male mariner relatives who had been active in the War of 1812. Um, one woman who had applied to be a resident of the Mariners Family Asylum actually had lost three sons to various maritime accidents. The three sons were all lost at sea. So, I mean, there were a lot of bad stories, a lot of hard luck stories for these women, but at least now they're in a home and, and they're being taken care of. And, um, you know, it's, it's a much better situation than living in the almshouse or the poorhouse or whatever you would like to call it. So, on June 9th, 1953, they have an official dedication for the Mariner's Family Asylum. They had all kinds of ceremonies. Um, the, the first stars and stripes that flew over the asylum were actually sewn by these 17 residents who were now living there. Um, one of the publications from that time period actually states that the women enjoyed looking at the harbor so they could contemplate the men in their lives who had never returned from the sea. By 19, 1868, excuse me, the asylum is actually described as being situated under a canopy of trees with views of the New York Harbor and the Narrows. Uh, they noted that the asylum was actually readily accessible from a ferry boat that came in at the very bottom of uh, Vanderbilt Avenue. That ferry landing at that time was known as Vanderbilt's Landing, you guessed it, involving the Vanderbilt family that was on staff. Staten Island. But anyway, people would come over from Brooklyn and they would get off there and they would walk up to the Mariner's Family Asylum to visit the, the, the women who were living in the home. So it was easily accessible. Um, the women who ran the facility were referred to as lady managers. Um, and of course, the, the matron was a, a female, as was the nurse. So Get this, this is a facility in the 1800s that is pretty much completely run by women. They're in charge of everything, you know, buying the food, uh, in charge of the activities of the women, they're in charge of making sure the place is heated, you know, the, 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 the roof isn't leaking. It's totally run by women and that is very unusual. There were some men on the board of trustees, but they were not involved with the day-to-day -day operation of the Mariner's Family Asylum. So that's something we always want to bear in mind with this, with this facility. By 1869, 55 women were in residence. That's quite a number of people. They called them back then, no matter where they resided, whether it was Sailor Snook Harbor, Farm Colony, Seaman's Retreat, the residents were always referred to as inmates. And I know it sounds strange to us today, we think of inmates as prisoners, but they weren't thought of as prisoners back in those days. So the inmates, according to one source, actually the New York Times, uh, quote, said the residents were, quote, remarkably happy and contented in their island home. Now, we all know that the newspapers tended to rosy things up a little bit, but I, I, I personally would have to believe that, that it's much, much more pleasant to live in this facility than in 
other locations, as I've mentioned already. 1869, they had the 25th anniversary of the Mariner's Family Industrial Society, which was, of course, the, the over um, the, the organization that overlooked the Mariner's Family Asylum here on Staten Island. Um, again, whenever there was an anniversary, they would uh, have a, a big party and, and the residents would, um, you know, uh, be part of the festivities. There was always uh, uh, somebody would come in and, and sing, perhaps, or, or play an instrument, a little fiddle or a violin or something. Religion also played a very important role in the lives of, the, of both the administrators and the residents because um, religion played a very big role in the lives of people in general in the 1800s. So very often they would bring in uh, uh, Protestant ministers to come in and have services for the women or uh, sometimes the ministers, I know there was one, Reverend Trump Orr was his name, he would um, sing and, and sing to the women and, and, and it was, you know, it was said to uplift them and, and bring their spirits up, you know, as, as, you know, the years went on. And we all know sometimes the later years are not always the happiest years. But, uh, you know, they generally had visitors, they generally had entertainment, they generally had, um, the, the, the religious uh, coming to, you know, uh, visit them and, and to have services for them. 1881, that fair is held at the Academy of Music in Brooklyn. And at this fair, they had all kinds of spaces where they were selling goods. Uh, they had different wares on display and for sale, and they had flowers all around the room and beautiful soft music playing in the background. Um, and it was a great success. They raised quite a bit of money for the organization. And as I said, it's still this really close-knit relationship with Brooklyn, you know, between the, the Staten Island facility and the people of Brooklyn. Um, by 1881, not all of the money um, that is being put into that Siemens fund, that fund that I mentioned where the seamen have to put in so much money um, every time they come into the harbor. Well, by 1881, we start to see that that uh, fund is no longer providing monies for the Mariner's Family Asylum. So they had to, you know, step things up and they started actually charging the women who came in, uh, usually $100, a one-time entrance fee of $100 to get in to the Mariner's Family Asylum. And that, of course, would pay for your food and your clothing and your funeral expenses when the time was, uh, you know, came about. So it, it, was, it was an important thing that, um, that fundraising um, business, as, as it is for any other charity, whether it was then or whether it was now. We see uh, more and more as the 1800s start getting to the 1890s, more and more fundraisers are starting to occur on Staten Island. Uh, the Brooklyn aspect of the asylum is not so active anymore, so the people on Staten Island are getting more and more involved with the Mariner's Family Asylum. Um, we also see by 1900 the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And as you know, they were very active on the island at that time, especially in Prohibition Park, a community that we now call Westerly, which was developed in order to uh, encourage uh, people stop, to stop drinking. Uh, they didn't want people drinking alcohol. They didn't want alcohol on the property at Prohibition Park. And they were going all over the island, different groups of women um, giving speeches and talks about not drinking. They were very often at the, at the um, Mar Mariner's Family Asylum. Why, I don't know, because I doubt there was very much alcohol being consumed there. But I'm sure it was one of the things that, that the women were, um, you know, brought their spirits up because they always came in with, with songs and, and music and things of that nature. All right, so um, 
by, by the early 1900s, we see there's about 28 women living at the Mariner's Family Asylum. And we also see that they're celebrating their 50th anniversary in, in 1903. Um, and they had a, a, a very suitable luncheon, shall we say, in order to celebrate this event. It was noted at the event that three women had passed during the previous year, but that five had been inducted, and now the, the population of the asylum was up to 36. Um, so they just continued on and on and on, um, and they were subjected to some of society's problems as well. And doing the research, I found out on August 31st, 1903, a well-dressed man appeared at the front door of the asylum, and he said that he was there to work on the telephone. They had a newly installed telephone, and here was this young man, and um, the, the matron let him in, and while he was fiddling around with the telephone, she went upstairs. And in the meanwhile, I guess the desk where the telephone was located, he, she had left $44. So when she came back downstairs, oh, the $44 is gone. So they call the police, and the police come, and they never really found the guy who, who stole the $44. But obviously, you know, the there was, there was troubles back in those days, shall we say. Things were not always as hunky-dory as people would like to think they were back in the old days. Um, uh, it was also a story I found of a big storm coming in in September of 1903. It was on, on the 16th of the month, and it was so uh, frightening that the women of the residents of the asylum, they were said to have been scared to death. So when it was over, they all felt a huge sigh of relief. But the problem was, the next day, the 17th, while the women of the Mariner's Family Asylum were sitting having their dinner, another storm started blowing across Staten Island, and it too was a horrible, horrible storm. In fact, the Richmond County Advance, the newspaper of the day, uh, said that the wind rushed with tornado violence, uprooted trees, toppled barns, and knocked down small outbuildings. Buildings. Now, this is the second storm in two days to hit the Mariner's Family Asylum. So as they're having dinner, the roof of the Mariner's Family Asylum was completely ripped off of its foundation at the top of the building, and it blew into the street. Just missed a few men who were standing outside. So we can imagine how scared and frightened these poor women were. It was fortunate, though, that the Mariner's Family Asylum was at least three stories tall, and the dining hall was down on the first story. So, I mean, that must have been a very, very, very difficult day for these women. Uh, life went on for the residents of the Mariner's Family Asylum. Uh, I found one notation where each Christmas, each resident would receive, quote, in a manner that carries them back in thought for the time being to their childhood, they find on the back of their seat at the dining table a stocking that holds a silver half dollar, candy, an orange, and other gifts that are placed inside the stocking. The Christmas feast was said to allow the residents to eat, drink, and be merry. Um, by 1908, the old ladies' home, as they were again referring to it as, was said to be richly endowed. And the 33 inmates who were there um, were actually safeguarded by a bank account that held several thousand dollars. It's, it was said that they had gathered uh, at least $5,000 the previous year from various residents of Staten Island and various companies on the island. People were very generous to the, the people who lived at the Mariner's Family Asylum. Um, as a side note, I also should note that there are said to be 92 individuals who passed while living at the Mariner's Family Asylum that are all um, in, a, in one spate, not in one grave, but in one area at a Moravian Cemetery in New Dorp. Now, things didn't always um, 
continue to, to be positive for the Mariners Family Asylum. We see a, a plea in the New York Times on February 6th, 1949. They were in dire straits financially. $10,000 had to be taken out of the account of the Mariners Family Asylum and used for uh, the installation of fire escapes on the exterior of the building. It was a fire regulation that they needed in order to uh, be up to code with the fire department, so it really um, used up a lot of their savings and the money that they had to use or wanted to use as a safety net for the asylum. But they did bound back, and um, you know they had uh, they had other problems though that came along. Unlike places like Sailor Snug Harbor that had a self-perpetuating endowment, the Mariners Family Asylum always relied on donations and the fares, and you know a generosity of shipping lines was another one. Um, so. We actually see that the donations start to go down by about 1949 and the finances go down. I also found that in 1949, the Marist Family Asylum had a very surprising resident. I didn't know that Alice Austin actually lived there in that year. And that was before she ended up at the farm colony. So they had let her in on a, on a, on a sort of a special arrangement. Most of the time, as I said, your father had to have been a mariner, your brother, your son. In, in this case, they allowed Alice Austin into the facil facility because her uncle Oswald had been a mariner and had gone all over the world uh, you know, on, on various ships in the 1800s. So she wasn't there for very long, but it was an inter interesting piece of history to uncover. We see that in the, uh, the 1960s and the 1970s, there are fewer and fewer women living in this facility. And as a matter of fact, we also see the Landmarks Preservation Commission formed in New York City for the five boroughs uh, in the mid-1960s. This was in response to the destruction of Penn Station. In any event, the Mariner's uh, Family Asylum on Tompkins Avenue was actually uh, put on the list of buildings that could possibly become uh, New York City landmarks. And as I said, this was about 1966, but nothing ever happened. So it was sort of put on the calendar. And then around 2007, uh, the New York Foundling Hospital, the, new, the then owners of the building, decided that they needed a new structure in order to do the, the work that they did using, using the facility. So they petitioned to have the building de-calendared because they wanted to knock it down and build a new facility. So when you go over to Tompkins Avenue and you, you see the, the New York Foundling um, Hospital, realize that that is not the Mariner's Family Asylum that once stood there. In fact, the Mariner's Family Asylum was an imposing three-floor structure that was done in the Italianate style. And one of the most interesting things to me is that I recently found out that a very good friend of mine in high school worked there. And on occasion, other friends and I would go pick her up from work and we would go into the building and I never realized it until about two years ago that I was actually in the original Mariner's Family Asylum because that's where she was working in the 1970s. Pretty wild stuff around, interesting how history comes around and moves in circles sometimes. So thank you very much. I want to uh, let you know two things. One is that this is a chapter in a book that I've been working on for a couple of years. So if you'd like to know more about it, keep your eye out for the book. It's called The Powerful Women of Staten Island's Past. And there will be even more information about the Mariner's Family Asylum in that, along with countless biographies and information about women who made an impact on Staten Island. And I also want you to bear in mind that this video and many others sponsored by Noble Maritime Collection, can be found at their website, noblemaritime.org slash now, N-O-W. Thanks so much.